be advised that this recorded webinar has been edited from its original format, which may have included a product demo. To set up a live demo or to request more information, please complete the form to the right. Or if you are currently not on CSC Global, there is a link to the website in the description of this video. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to a new European fund structure, Ireland's Investment Limited Partnership. Um, thanks to CSC, of course, for hosting us today. I'm Kevin Neubauer, a partner in the investment management group at Seward & Kissel in New York. Uh, my practice focuses on investment fund formation generally and related U.S. regulatory work. Um, today's discussion, I think, will be useful for managers and service providers, both in Europe and in the U.S. Um, you know, for, from my perspective, for U.S. managers in particular, I think the discussion will demystify to a degree the process of launching an EU vehicle in an existing fund structure and marketing in Europe. And um, of course, it will also give managers, I think, a good sense of the considerations involved in choosing a jurisdiction and why Ireland, particularly with this new structure, you know, may be an attractive option. Um, I'm joined by an esteemed group of industry experts today. They have various experiences and they can tackle these issues that we're going to be talking about. Um, you know, with that, I'll turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves. And uh, Barry, we'll start with you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, my name is Barry O'Connor. I'm a partner in Matheson. Um, Matheson is Ireland's largest law firm. We're a full service corporate law firm and we focus on international companies doing business in and from Ireland and in particular in the financial services space. Uh, I'm in our asset management department. We're Ireland's largest asset management department. So we have 11 partners and over 60 fee earners and we act for 30 percent of the Irish market. And that goes from everything from long only equity mutual funds, uh, ETFs, money market funds, all the way up to uh, illiquid private equity and real asset strategies for which the ILP is going to be particularly relevant. Pass over to Michael. Thanks, Barry. Um, uh, I'm Michael Humphreys. I'm from Davy, which is a large Irish um, financial services company. We're one of the largest independent uh, providers in, in Ireland with a business that spans wealth management, asset management, corporate finance, uh, institutional broking. Um, and we've been in business for over 90 years. While we're predominantly based in Ireland and headquartered in Ireland, we also have offices in the UK, where I'm based, and in Luxembourg. And we provide fund services through our integrated asset management and fund services company, which is called Davy Global Fund Management on a pan-European basis to funds all across the EU. And we're particularly um, excited about the developments in the Irish Investment Limited Partnership, which I think is a huge addition to the Irish funds landscape. Uh, but we, on a broader basis, act as AFIM to Irish funds, including the ILP, and as USIS Manco for uh, USIS funds across Europe as well. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I'll go next. So my name is Brian Murphy. I'm a tax partner with Grant Thornton in Dublin. Um, my focus is on the financial services space. And we would, like the other panelists, have a significant presence across the financial services and in particular in the asset management space with um, a, a very strong audit advisory and tax practice. So the, our practice has experienced, I think, fair to say, extensive growth over the last four or five years, particularly in relation to asset management, where the firm now sits, I think, uh, on a par with the, the bigger uh, service providers across all three work streams being across audit, uh, advisory, and indeed tax compliance and tax advisory services. So I'll pass over to you, Paul. Thanks, Brian. My name is Paul Whelan. I'm Managing Director and Head of Depository Services at CSC. I'm charged with building our business across Europe in tandem with our fund administration and capital markets business. I've worked in the industry for over 20 years, holding global roles with a number of large financial institutions. Great. Thank, thanks, all. Um, before we get started, we'll just do a quick overview of you know, what we intend to cover today. 
um, you know, we covered the introductions. We're gonna cover sort of, a, you know, at a high level, um, an introduction to the ILP structure and where it might fit within an existing fund structure. Um, you know, the, the advantages of, you know, of, of setting up a, a fund structure in Europe generally, um, legal and tax implications, and then specifically with one of these structures, the role of a, of a depository. So, so let's start with, with you, Barry, if you would, if you could provide an overview of the ILP and, and, and kind of identify what you want people to take away from this webinar in terms of um, the, the possibility that they may use an ILP going forward. Sure, Kevin, thanks. Um, so what I want people to take away from the webinar is actually quite simple. So Ireland is and has long been the leading domicile in Europe for regulated funds pursuing alternative strategies. Um, the reasons for this uh, are pretty straightforward. So we've got flexible regulatory regime, unmatched speed to market, uh, top-notch expert service providers, and an English-speaking, you know, commercially focused, solutions-driven service culture. The one caveat we always had to say in the past to that was that while we had, you know, excellent uh, corporate fund structure, trust fund structure, uh, tax fund transparent contractual fund structure, we didn't have a viable partnership vehicle. We do now have that, and that's what I want people to take away from today. So Ireland's existing leading regulated domicile in Europe now offers it a partnership, and we're open for business, essentially. Um, we spent many years trying to put the partnership in place to make sure it offered uh, for managers such as yourselves the same features that you'd expect to see in a Cayman partnership, for example, or in a Luxembourg partnership. As a result, the structure chart you see here really should look relatively familiar for you. Um, in terms of the ILP, so the, the Irish version of a, of a limited partnership, um, I'll just talk about a few, few of the provisions, um, which hopefully should uh, you know, ring true for you. So it's obviously constituted by an LPA between GP and the LPs. Um, the LPA in Ireland is a very flexible document, so there's very few mandatory provisions that have to go into it. And you've got kind of a carte blanche as to the types of provisions you want to include. So that's obviously a welcome and necessary piece. Um, it's easily amendable, so you don't require investor or LP uh, approval where the change you're making isn't prejudicial to them. Where it is prejudicial to them, you require a approval of the majority of the LPs, but you get to define what constitutes majority in that case. So it's entirely possible, for example, to have special LP classes that have particular voting rights. The ILP is constituted um, by the GP and the LPs, as I mentioned. The GP itself is not a regulated entity in Ireland, so you don't require central bank approval or local regulatory approval. It's, it's easy to set up. Um, and as regards the LPs, obviously they have limited liability. That's a, that's a key piece of them. Um, they can maintain that liability by not participating in the management of the partnership. And the legislation which sets up the ILP in Ireland contains a white list of activities, things that the LPs can do without losing their limited liability. It's a fairly standard list, things like participating in advisory committees, voting on matters, sitting on boards of directors, all of those are acceptable activities for an LP to do without losing their limited liability. All of that really is things you might expect to see in a partnership, you would have expected to see in a partnership. What you mightn't be familiar with is the, the regime, the, the regulatory regime that the partnership sits uh, within. It's Ireland's existing regime, and as I said, it is the leading uh, regulatory regime in Europe for alternative strategies, and it's called the QAIF regime, so the Qualifying Investor Alternative Investment Fund regime, the QAIF regime. A few things to note about it. It is a regulated fund, but it's not actually reviewed by the regulator. The Central Bank of Ireland, which is the regulatory body, they don't review the documentation. They rely on the law firms such as Matheson telling them that the documentation complies. So actually, the speed to market is unrivaled. You, you make a filing with the Central Bank looking for regulatory approval for your fund, and you have it 24 hours later. In other countries in Europe, that's not the case. There's a lengthy regulatory approval where the bank reviews your documentations, asks questions. That can take months on end. That's not the case in Ireland. The other good thing about the regulatory regime in Ireland is that there's very, very few rules around what you can and can't invest in. It's a very flexible regulatory regime. Now, the quid pro quo for that is you can only sell the fund or market it to professional or qualifying investors. So professional investors is a test uh, you may be familiar with. It's in European legislation under MIFID, essentially, you know, credit institutions, in companies as a whole. Um, or if you're talking about natural persons, you're really talking about uh, high net worth individuals. In Ireland, you can also actually offer it to qualifying investors, which is a slightly broader pool. And essentially, that allows anybody who can certify that they understand the risks to invest. That's particularly useful where you want employees within the manager who want to invest in the fund, and they may not be themselves high net worth. Um, with that uh, piece, you can also get uh, access to the European Marketing Passport, which is something that Michael's going to talk about in a second. 
One other element to note there is the minimum investment rules. So you can only sell it to those professional investors, but they have to commit at least 100,000 euro for these types of strategies. That's not typically been a problem. So as I said, that Irish regulatory regime has been around for a while. It's the leading one in Europe. And people have done kind of private equity real asset strategies in Ireland before. They've typically done them in corporate structures, which isn't perfect because most investors are looking for a partnership. But where they have done them, they've worked well. One issue in the past has been because Ireland didn't have a partnership and you did want to do those types of strategies, some of the things you did in the past existed perhaps in a gray area in the rules. So you had to interpret the rules in a certain way to make things work. That's not the case anymore. So the rules have been clarified to make clear that the things managers such as yourselves want to do within these strategies work absolutely fine. So, you know, using capital accounting within the partnership, carried interest, uh, excuse, exclude rights, stage investing, all of that um, has been clarified by the central bank as being absolutely acceptable. So uh, that's a positive change. If you look at the structure chart for a moment, um, as I said, it should be relatively familiar to you. Uh, if you look at kind of the right-hand side uh, and down at the bottom in terms of the investments, from the Irish perspective, the partnership is incredibly flexible. You can set up whatever you want below. The partnership itself is tax transparent, something Brian's going to talk about. And so obviously what you actually do set up below is incredibly important to make sure that the investors get the tax, tax treatment that they want. But from the Irish perspective, the partnership perspective, there's complete flexibility down below. The partnership could hold the assets directly. You could have holding vehicles. They can take whatever form you want. They can be essentially wherever you want. The tax analysis can drive those. And as I said, Brian will talk about that in a second. On the left of the chart, then, you'll see some of the service providers. So there might be some there that are unfamiliar to you. There's the AFM. Michael's going to talk about that in a second. There's the depository, and, and Paul's going to talk about that. And the investment manager typically is you guys. Um, that would be the, the entity who wants to set up the partnership. And from an Irish perspective, there's absolutely no problem with that manager being a U.S. manager. And as Michael will talk about in a second, having the Irish AFM there means that you still get access to the European passport. And if you look at the a fund administrator, that should be a role that you're very familiar with. So on the whole, that's the structure chart, uh, that's the partnership, and the message is we now have one, it works, and we're open for business. Cool, thanks, Barry. You know, I, based on what how you've described the flexibility that these structures offer, I would expect, as a general matter, a, a U.S. manager that had, you know, um, multiple feeders, one in the EU and one in the U.S., could, could expect to have fairly similar partnership agreements um, as between the, you know, the Delaware limited partnership and the, and the Irish um, LP, um, given the flexibility that both provide. I, I would expect you'd be able to achieve, um, you know, achieve a, a high degree of similarity between the two documents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things we've been doing since this has been introduced is, is talking to managers like people on the webinar, but actually also, Kevin, talking to law firms such as your own to ask them that question. So we've We've uh, talked to some firms we know very well and said, look, can you give us uh, you know, your template Delaware one or what your clients would typically see? We'll Irishize yeah. it for you. And you can see you know, how many changes are there. And uh, as you said, there aren't that many. And the, the law firms we've spoken to have said, well, actually, I yeah, know if, if we were to put this in front of our clients, they'd be happy that uh, there's no changes and you know, the way they want it to work will still work in Ireland. Yeah, understood. Um, so with that with that full-throated pitch for Ireland, anything to add on, on why a U.S. manager or anyone else for that matter should choose Ireland? Um, I think partially is, is obviously why Europe. And if you, you know, you're know you going to Europe because you want to access European investors. And when you come to Europe, really the decision has long been Ireland or Luxembourg. Um, and sometimes when you're looking at that question, there's a hard reason why you would choose one over the other. So, for example, if you were setting up an ETF, and it was going to invest in, you know, track the S&P 500, for example, you'd always choose Ireland because Ireland has a better tax treaty for ETFs. And, you know, that kind of a, a benefit is a hard reason to choose Ireland. In this partnership space in the past, the hard reason pointed you towards Luxembourg was that Ireland's partnership model didn't really work. That hard reason yeah. is now gone. And so really you're into the softer reasons. And consistently down through the years, when it comes to those soft reasons, managers have said they prefer Ireland over Lux. We have clients who have funds in both jurisdictions, and they would say time and time again, if it weren't for X hard reason, I'd love to do this particular fund in Ireland. And so those soft reasons to give you a flavor of what they are, you know, Ireland and Luxembourg, both obviously European jurisdictions, but the way in which rules are enforced and implemented can be a little bit different. So, for example, when it comes to AML in Luxembourg, 
typically you have to give you know actual wet ink copies of documents that have been certified as true copies you have to get documents certified with a, in front of a luxembourg notary those types of things can cause a real problem when you're trying to set up a fund under time pressure you know that can pose yeah. a little bit of an execution risk when you hit those bumps in the road and they really after you've done a couple of your funds they start to grate a little bit and those soft reasons make a difference other things are softer still the fact that you know ireland obviously english is our native language that does make a difference um i don't know what the number is but there's you know, there, there must be hundreds of flights between Ireland and the US monthly. I think in Luxembourg, there's one every two days or something like that. It's difficult to get to. Those things make a difference. I've heard people say to me, the service culture in Ireland is much stronger. You know, it's an Anglo-Saxon service culture. So certainly me, you know, as a lawyer, I, I don't really work nine to five, but I had one client uh, describe to me in Luxembourg, the hours as, you know, being 10 to four and golf on the mornings of a Friday. So don't call. Uh, that's not what you're going to get in Ireland. If you expect a high level of service provider uh, standards from, you know, your law firm in the States, the CSC people you, you work with there, you'll get the same in Ireland. And, um, uh, you know, the feedback I've received isn't uh, isn't quite the same in Luxembourg. So it tends to be those softer reasons. Um, and so if you are coming to Europe for the first time and you're weighing up Ireland or Luxembourg, I talk to people, peer managers who are in Europe already and get their impressions because they've long told me that um, they prefer Ireland over Lux. Yeah, great, thanks Barry. So so Michael, um, you know, thanks for being here today. From your perspective, from the sort of in-house perspective, why would a US manager specifically consider launching a fund in the EU and then of course specifically Ireland? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, um, so the main reason I think why US managers that I speak to look to set up European funds is to find the best route possible to access European investors. And Barry touched about uh, touched on this a little bit in 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 when he in his uh, talk. Um, the European marketing passport is a uh, facility available under AIFMD, which is the Alternative Investment Fund Managers Directive, which is the European regulatory uh, rules um, that govern alternative investment funds on a pan-European basis. And that effectively provides a mechanism to, uh, if you like, register your fund uh, once for distribution right across the EU. And that is extremely attractive to, to all managers, but particularly to non-EU managers, such as US asset managers wanting to enter the European market, which is, in the end of the day, a patchwork of different regulatory regimes, different legal regimes, different regulators, and uh, different rules in each country. So it provides a level of consistency that allows US managers to easily target um, the European market. And I'll, I'll talk just a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, uh, the, by contrast, the um, other ways of targeting the European market and European investors which are sometimes used um, would be things like reverse solicitation or the national private placement regimes. And each of those has uh, limitations or drawbacks by comparison with the uh, European marketing passport. So reverse solicitation, I won't talk about it for long, but very briefly, as everyone will know, reverse solicitation is very useful where you do have genuine inquiries from uh, potential investors coming in without prompting from, from the manager. But it's not a marketing strategy. In fact, the whole concept of reverse solicitation is that it's not based on marketing. So it can't really be relied on to target European investors. And if it's pushed too far, it comes with both regulatory risk and uh, liability risk, uh, both in terms of regulatory sanction and investor complaints. So so um, while you sometimes hear it referred to, I wouldn't describe it as a, as a marketing strategy. Uh, national private placement regimes, by contrast, have been used for a very long time for accessing uh, EU institutional investors, uh, but they have the drawbacks I mentioned earlier, the patchwork nature, the fact that the rules change on a periodic basis. So you have to both do your uh, legal and regulatory due diligence on entering a market and also on an ongoing basis. You need to uh, register with the uh, relevant uh, regulatory authority and keep on top of changes. Uh, there is also, I suppose, a shift over time in um, in restricting to some degree the availability of national private placement regimes in Europe and a, a kind of a concept under AFMD that in an ideal world you'd have usage funds for retail investors and AFES for professional investors and the idea of 
a private placement of other types of funds into Europe is 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 perhaps one that the, some European regulators would like to get away from. But it's still there at the moment, and it is a viable route to market, particularly if you have a small number of target jurisdictions. But the marketing passport really simplifies a lot of those issues, and it also perhaps offers better investor acceptability. Certain um, EU institutional investors do have a preference for onshore European fund structures as opposed to offshore non-European fund structures, which might be perceived as coming from you know, lightly regulated or unregulated uh, jurisdictions. And sometimes that's driven by their own mandate reasons or internal co corporate governance reasons. So another advantage of an onshore EU fund is you maximize your attractiveness to European institutional investors. Um, so the so that's kind of in a nutshell, I think, why the marketing passport is important and where that leads to your question, Kevin, about um, why, why they want to set up a European fund is that the rules for accessing the marketing passport require two things. Uh, number one is the fund has to be a European fund. Now, it can be domiciled anywhere in, the, in Europe, but as Barry said, you know, the main jurisdictions would be perhaps Ireland, which, which would probably be number one. Uh, uh, the UK used to be, but obviously the UK is no longer part of the EU since, 31, since the transition period ended on 31 December. So that's, that doesn't count for the point of view of the marketing passport. And then Luxembourg it will, be the, will be the other one. So, um, so you need an EU domicile for your fund, and you also need an EU AFIM. And again, Barry briefly referred to the AFIM role. And just to explain to US managers what the AFIM actually is and what it does, the AFIM is the party that manages the fund in a broad sense. Um, it does things like dealing with the regulator, posting regulatory capital, managing regulatory reporting, overseeing uh, delegates, overseeing distribution, um, and so on. And, and from a regulator's point of view, you, you group um, two of the main functions of the AFIM being risk management or risk oversight and portfolio management. And it's very common where a US manager appoints or sets up a European fund that the AFIM would be a local AFIM, um, like ourselves, that's one of the services we do. Um, but actually, you then delegate the portfolio management back to the US, back to the US manager. And that's a well-tried and tested model. And what it means is that the US manager can have the best of both worlds, in a sense. They can have an EU fund domiciled in Ireland, like the ILP, for example, with the availability of the European marketing passport, and with the AFIM role filled by a local party, which means that the US asset manager doesn't need boots on the ground in Ireland. So, so that's a huge advantage. You can run your European fund from the US with the same asset manager that runs your other uh, fund structures. For example, you might have a Cayman or Delaware vehicle or some other vehicles in the world to target specific investor groups. You can run all of those structures together with your European structure from your US asset manager without boots on the ground in Europe. So um, so, so hopefully that uh, deals with that, Kevin. Very helpful, yeah, very helpful. And, and then just be, before we turn it over to Brian, you know, wh where do you see one of these structures fitting in to a US manager sort of global distribution strategy? Yeah, I, I think that there's a couple of issues that come into play there. And I, I touched on it a minute ago that, you know, a lot of the US asset managers I deal with uh, they already have fund structures in place, or they have a series of yeah. of, of, of existing funds. And you, you mentioned it yourself, Kevin, in terms of you know the um, similarity or otherwise of documentation across those structures. But one important um, factor that U.S. asset managers need to think about is, for example, if if you're in a private equity strategy or an infrastructure strategy or some other, uh, perhaps a real estate strategy and you're housing it in, a, say, an Irish ILP, um, how do you manage the investments across multiple fund structures? And probably the first thing that springs to mind for a US asset manager is um, a feeder-type approach where the European fund feeds into the, Euro the US fund or the Cayman or Delaware fund, and that's where the assets are held. Um, but there's a very important restriction in the marketing passport, which... Uh, denies you the access to the marketing passport if you effectively feed 100% of the European capital into the non-European structure. And in fact, the limit is set at 85%. So if you take 
more than 85% or more of your European raised capital and you invest that from the European fund into the US or Delaware fund, for example, you, you lose the benefit of the marketing passport. So that's a challenge. There are a number of yeah. ways around it which managers work with, including uh, reverse feeders or partial feeders or parallel funds where the European and the US fund operate in parallel. Um, and they, they can work very well, even for very complex, uh, very illiquid asset strategies. But the, the issues that sort of the manager deals with are, you know, deal allocation, deal splitting, co-holding, um, trying to match the performance of the European fund and the US fund. And all those yep. are all issues that, that can be dealt with um, with appropriate structuring. Um, yep. So. Understood. Yeah. No, and, and that's, you know, th those are sort of, it's, it's a. Uh... A necessary evil having to deal with those investment allocation issues, but um, you know something that certainly is not, um, you know, not, not a common issue to address for a sophisticated asset manager. So, so Brian, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. Um, you know, from from a tax perspective, how do you how do you characterize the benefits of the ILP structure vis-a-vis -vis other structures out there in the market? Uh, thanks, Kevin. Um, like, like any good lawyer, I think Barry has actually covered this already when he mentioned earlier <laughs> that the structure was tax transparent. So uh, yeah. like Barry is a good lawyer, I'm a good tax advisor, so I'll say a little bit more than that. Um, but, but essentially, th that's the first <laughs> key point here. Th this is a fully tax transparent structure from an Irish tax perspective. So as you'd expect in a transparent structure, uh, there should be no Irish tax on income and gains in the limited partnership or indeed on distributions that are any income flows that flow via, through the partnership. One obvious exception is where you have funding at the level of the partnership. There may be Irish withholding tax considerations in that scenario. But essentially, the structure is set up such that um, the income will flow through the transparent structure and the income will be deemed to be income of the partners. Um, this probably a very important point um, from an investment perspective is that just generally allows the partners to retain the characteristics that the income would have had uh, at the level of the fund should it have been a corporate fund. So for example, if you've capital gains at portfolio level, they and they're beneficial that the character of the gains remains intact at investor level, then that will be the, the outcome in a transparent structure. The partnership itself will have to file some limited um, Irish tax returns, really information type returns rather than anything else um, that will effectively, in the form of a tax return, allocate income and gains to, to the various partners. And then the last kind of key point, I suppose, on the basic tax features of the ILP anyway, is that, uh, and something that is very relevant for the US market, is much like the corporate structure, the ICAV, the ILP, even though it's transparent and um, it can check the box from a US perspective so it leaves um, something that again Barry had mentioned earlier in terms of flexibility of both the structure from a legal perspective and indeed a regulatory perspective there's also significant flexibility uh, from a tax perspective as well and, and from a US market in particular the check the box election is obviously something that that is potentially useful so th th they're the basic the basic points um, Kevin. Great. Well, thanks, Brian, and, and thanks for thanks for uh, going quickly through that since we're almost out of time. But I wanted to make sure we had a chance to hear from Paul uh, from CSC um, specifically to talk about this important issue about depository. So, could you explain the depository function for for U.S. managers, Paul, that may not be familiar with what it is and what it's all about? Sure, sure, Kevin, no problem at all. And I'll keep this quite succinct given that we're nearly up on time. So first of all, I think it's important to recognize that the depository is not a delegate of the GP or the AFM. It's an independent service provider to the ILP and has a fiduciary responsibility to act in the interests of the limited partners. The depository must be domiciled in Ireland and be authorized by the central bank as a full scope or specialized real asset depository. The IFMD, which is an EU directive, the depository is obliged to discharge three core duties, cash flow monitoring, 
asset safekeeping and oversight. Uh, cash flow monitoring involves reviewing all cash flows through the ILP's bank accounts with an aim of identifying any significant cash flows or cash flows that are inconsistent with the operations of the ILP. And the depository has to ensure that the bank accounts are opened with appropriate institutions in the name of the ILP and that all capital contributions flow into these bank accounts. Moving on to asset safekeeping, which covers both assets in custody and record keeping and ownership verification of other assets, i.e. assets that are not capable of being held in custody. Um, so safekeeping of assets in custody is not really relevant uh, to ILP structures, so I'll pass over that and move on to record keeping and ownership verification of other assets, which involves ensuring that all non-custody assets, such as private equity, real estate, infrastructure, etc., are held in the ownership of the ILP, both initially at the point of transaction and on, a, and on an ongoing basis thereafter. And the depository is required to maintain an up-to-date register of all other assets that it is satisfied or owned by the ILP. And then the final duty is that of oversight. And the oversight duty is quite broad. It involves overseeing the AFM and its delegates to ensure that the ILP is managed in accordance with its constitutional documents and the regulations. The depository generally focuses its reviews on the valuation of assets, capital activity, income distributions, investment restriction monitoring, waterfall cal calculations, and settlement of investment transactions. And the depository is required to report any material issues found or errors, investment breaches to the Central Bank of Ireland. Great. Uh Thanks, Paul, for that for that brief summary. Um, we are just about out of time, you know, and we didn't really get uh, to questions that that people may have. So if you if you um, sent a question to the chat function, we'll be sure to get back to you on a one-off basis. And then certainly, if any other questions come to mind um, as you digest the, the information presented today, feel free to um, you know let any of the panelists know. And uh, we thank you for making the time here for the for the presentation on the new Irish ILP structure. Um, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks all.